What we're going to talk about today is five instances where God encountered people through his son Jesus in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, it's important for us to note that these particular stories all happened before Jesus died. But rooted in the very essence of each of these stories is, in fact, a very, very important lesson. Each of the stories today that we're going to be talking about is about burdens. It's about five different ways of five different burdens that Jesus took off of people. In their circumstance, yes, these are real events that really happen to real people. But he was able to take these burdens because, as the word of God promises us or explains to us, he took them all upon himself. There's a famous uh, meme that goes around at at this time of the year. It says, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is it only happened once and he volunteered. And well, the truth that we know is that Jesus went to the cross for all of the burdens of all mankind. Today, we're going to take a few minutes to look at some of these burdens, to remember the stories behind them. And then I want each of you to ask yourself, With the help of the Holy Spirit, what about me? Do I have burdens in these areas? So the first thing we're going to start off with is this burden of past mistakes. This is quite a a famous story, though not as well known as a lot of the other stories. We read this from Luke chapter 7. And, you know, Luke is one of my favorite authors because he spends a lot of time talking about banquets. Now, in the Mediterranean world, as a result of sort of the Greco classicism and then the Greco Roman influence, dinners that were banquets are pretty formal affairs. They're pretty well organized. They start off with not sitting around a table, which people might do for a meal on their own, but these banquets. People reclined at a table. They lay on their side, they propped themselves up, they ate with their hands, and their feet stuck out. On the, They weren't in a chair, they were like in a sofa or in a couch or actually a small bed. This story is a fascinating story. You find it in Luke chapter 7. And in this particular story, Jesus is invited by this Pharisee to go into his house. And he goes into his house and he's there for this kind of an event. Now, there's a lot of things that we don't know that we can speculate. For instance, most people didn't have fully contained houses. And even if it was a formal dinner, the doors were left open because the people outside might want to watch. And in these dinners, the big part was you share this meal together. And then there's a dialogue between perhaps the host and perhaps an invited guest. It might even be a poet. Occasionally, it would even be a musician. And if you were in a Roman or a a, a pagan setting, there might be some pretty unsavory things that would happen in that dinner. But if you were in a good Jewish setting, then after the service was over, there would be a time of talking about the things of God, and then there would be the hymn that would be sung at the end. But there would be this discussion called a symposium. And in this particular story, this Pharisee brings Jesus in, and Jesus is reclined at the table, and all of a sudden, somebody acts. We can speculate that she was a woman that had come in and either was watching from the outside or she had come in and sat around the outside edges as people were allowed to do to dialogue. But what she did was absolutely shocking. She approached Jesus. In a good Jewish setting, it was unusual for her to approach Jesus. What was especially unusual about her was that she was known as a woman who was known in the city as a sinner. Now, we don't know what her sins are, but there's a fairly limited bunch of them that it could be. We don't know how she got there. Did she get abandoned by her husband? Did she get thrown away scornfully? Did her parents sell her into slavery or prostitution? All of these are possibilities. A woman without a man to support her and care for her had very few options in those days. One option was to die, to starve, and the other was to attach yourself to anybody who would take care of you, even if they only took care of you for a day. This was that woman's reputation. We know it's true because as she approached Jesus, she let her hair down. 
A married woman never let her hair down except for in the home in front of her husband. It was one of the alluring things about her. For a woman to let her hair down in public meant that she was trying to allure other people. Now, I'm not saying that's good, bad, or anything. I'm just saying that's what it was like 2,000 years ago. A married woman covered up her hair. This woman lets her hair down. She approaches Jesus' feet. And as she approaches Jesus' feet, she begins to cry. And then she begins to take her hair and wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. And then she takes a very expensive kind of perfume and she pours it over his feet. The perfume is worth about a year's wages. Very, very, very expensive. And immediately the man who's a Pharisee begins to complain and he begins to talk and he says, you know, this doesn't look right. Here's this Jesus who's this teacher and all of a sudden he's lying there on this couch and this woman approaches him. In a non-Jewish context, she was there to perform for him sexually. She did what prostitutes would do if they were tax collectors and sinners. But that's not what she did. See, everybody in that room knew how bad and evil she was. She was a wicked woman. And she was behaving in a way that was appropriate. It was the birds of a feather flock together attack on Jesus. If he was a real holy man, he wouldn't be anywhere near. Everybody knew who she was. Jesus tells him a little story. He says, just think about it for a moment. Just suppose that there's two people who owe a debt to the manager of an estate. And one of them owes him two months' worth of two months' salary, and one of them owes two years' salary. Two months? Two years. He calls them both in, and the man who owes him two months, he says to him, Okay, I'm going to wipe your debt free. You're no longer in debt to me. Go. And then to the other one, he says, You. Two years, I'm going to wipe your debt free too. You go. And then Jesus says to the Pharisee, he says, which one do you think loves the manager more? The Pharisee says, well, obvious, the greater one who has been forgiven but his greater debt. And Jesus said, that's right. And then he says, you know, Simon, ever since I got here, you didn't treat me with respect. You didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't have me, give me the opportunity to put oil so that my skin would be soothed. This woman, she washed my feet with her tears. She washed, she wiped them with her hair. And she poured the most expensive perfume that they could have in those days on his feet, which were going to go back into sandals and walk down the road. Now, what is it that we want to remember in this story? The first thing that we need to know is that it's really clear from this story, and, and you and I may not have understood it, but when, when you look at this story carefully, she already knows who Jesus is. And in fact, we don't know when or we don't know how, or we don't know why. Jesus has already forgiven her. Jesus says, the reason she loves me so much is because she's had so much sin forgiven. I mean, in that society, she's a woman, she's a prostitute, doesn't get much more sinful than that. Jesus said, that's why she loves me so much. And parenthetically, that's why you don't. And then Jesus does something really interesting. This woman has had this burden of being a loose woman. Her life... Everybody knows what kind of woman she is. She's made mistakes. You might have said, and I've heard people say, I'd die before I'd do that. That's the good, moral, upright thing to do. But, you know, we don't always do the good, moral, upright thing to do. We make mistakes. And her mistakes had scarred her. When she took her hair down, nobody was surprised. She's that kind of girl. What does Jesus say to her? First, he explains to the Pharisee, Pharisee, you've got it all wrong, you see. She has been forgiven. And then he says of her to everybody there, your faith has led to the forgiveness of your sins. And he tells everybody in the whole community, whatever her past mistakes were, they don't matter to me because they've been forgiven. 
And now she's set free and she's just as pure and clean as anybody here. Her past mistakes, her burden of past mistakes are taken. And her burden of past mistakes are taken and put at the cross. Another story. This is a very, very well-known story. It's a story of insignificance. Past mistakes have been made. Insignificance, the story unwinds a little bit differently. Insignificance comes to us, and this story is repeated in the Gospels in a, in a, in a kind of a, a one, one commentator calls it a Mark sandwich because Mark puts two people together in two different stories and combines them. Jesus goes back to his hometown, and there he's met by a guy named Jairus, and, and the guy says, oh, please, 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 come and, and hurry because my daughter's dying, and so Jesus goes along with him, and while they're on, a way, on the way, he meets somebody. Now, if you know a little bit about your Bible, you know a little bit about this woman, but let me tell you some stories about this woman. Let me tell you what are the things that we see. Number one, she's in the crowd, and in the crowd, she's in a, she's in a dangerous position. Because the second thing we know about her is that she's been sick for 12 years. Now, it's not any ordinary sickness, but she is having uh, uh, some kind of an issue of blood that comes out of her, her womb. It's not her normal period. It's something that goes on and on and on and on for 12 years. So, Pastor Dave, that's terrible. Just think how, how weak she must feel. And, and nowadays, you could take, you know, all the different medicines and everything, but she'd be struggling with, uh, uh, you know, uh, blood problems and health problems and everything else. But it's much, much, much worse. You see, she's gone to all the doctors that she can go to, and they've taken all of her money. So she's a woman, she's sick, and she has no money, and then it gets worse. Because according to the ritual laws of purity, she's unclean. She's not unclean for four or five days a month. She's unclean all the time for 12 years. She's not a leper. It's not as bad as leprosy, but it, it's about as bad. Anybody who touches her, whether they brush against her, whether they run into her, anybody who touches her must go and take off all the clothes that they have and wash them in a certain way and take a certain kind of a ritual bath and then they get dressed up before they can participate in any kind of community activity. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if it was like if you ran into a person like that on your way home and then when you got home you have to go through this whole process before you can sit down and eat with your family? If she, if she touches you. If she sits down in a chair, the chair has to be washed. If she sits at a table, the table has to be washed. If she used eating implements, the implements have to be washed. Not just washed, but washed in a certain way. Now, all of this leads us to this woman who is a social outcast, who in her position in society is about as unimportant as it can possibly be. We don't even know her name. We don't know how old she is. We don't know what village she's from. We don't know anything about her except as Jesus is walking through the crowd, she's taking an enormous chance to be close there because the people in the crowd who know her are going to be like, stay away from me. And then she has this amazing idea. I'm going to touch Jesus. Now think, if she touches him, what happens? He's unclean, right? Right? So he's on his way to do something. She's going to touch him, and he becomes unclean. He's going to have to go take a certain kind of bath, change his clothes, do all this kind of stuff. And so she's thinking, I've got to touch him in such a way that it will impact me miraculously, but nobody will notice. She does. Jesus turns around and says, who did that? Everybody says, what do you mean, who touched you? What kind of question is that? It's a big crowd. It wasn't a big crowd around her, I promise you. And then she said, I, I did it. And he said, you're clean. It's over. You're clean. You're healed. You're well. Your life has changed. Now, what's going on here right now? What, what does that have to do with this insignificance? Because Jesus is on his way to go spend time rescuing the daughter of one of the most important men in the community. And all of a sudden, there's this woman who, who has this burden. 
She has this burden that she has been sick for 12 years. I didn't do the math. How many, how many 12 years is like, uh, what, 3,000, 4,000, 4,300 and something days? Jesus just needs to go over here and take care of this rich guy's, important guy's daughter. He can wait one more day. She can wait one more day. Nobody cares. Nobody cares what happens to her. Everybody cares what happens to Jairus' daughter. Everybody cares what happens to Jairus. Everybody cares as they're going. Everybody wants to see what Jesus is going to do. And Jesus doesn't care. You see, this woman has an enormous burden of insignificance. She's as insignificant as she can possibly be. And Jesus takes her insignificance. And he takes it away. We are not all born smart. We are not all born skilled athletes. We are not all born intelligent, creative. We are not all born with finely shaped heads. Some of you have to hide yours, and I do feel sorry for you. We're not all famous. We're not all important. Have you, ever, have you ever felt, have you ever said to yourself, they can't treat me like that. I matter. I'm important. You know, I, I read once a, psycho, a psychologist said, if you grew up in a family with more than five kids, you did not get enough attention and you felt insignificant to your parents. Now, I don't know if that's true or not for all of you who have more than five siblings. Let me know later if you think it's true. Those of you who had those, you're looking at your other sibling and saying, it was, it was him or her that was insignificant, not me. But you see, we go through life so many times with these horrible feelings about ourselves, these horrible feelings of insignificance. You think no one cares? In this world, you're probably right. But Jesus cares. Jesus cares. That's why he came to the cross. If you're here and you bear a burden of insignificance, if only somebody would give me a chance, if only I had a chance to prove what I was going to do, if only all of these different things were true, then somehow Jesus cares. To Jesus, you are important. You are valuable. He loves you and he cares for you. He'll take your burden of insignificance. Hopelessness. This is a terrific story. I want to thank uh, Alan Onojuku, who's helping us interning with IES at this time. He brought this story to my attention when I was preparing for this. It's a terrific story. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? There's two stories about Mary and Martha, and they're both really interesting. And one of the stories, of course, they, they, the two sisters fight with each other. Now, um, I have one sibling, a sister, and when we fought, there was no contest. If it was physical, I won. If it was intellectual, I lost. It was just really easy. So I stuck with physical fights. But the story that's most famous about Mary and Martha is the story about their brother Lazarus dying. And it's a long and it's a complicated story, but there's a really powerful part in it. You see, Jesus has heard about Lazarus dying and he has stayed away for four days until after Lazarus dies because he wants them to have a burden. He's got something to show. Now what he wants to show is about hopelessness. So Jesus gets his disciples and they go and they head over to that town of Bethany, just really, really close to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, Martha comes running out to him and says, Jesus, if you had have got here on time, my brother would still be alive. And Jesus said, don't you know, Martha, that he will rise again? Yeah, she says, I understand the theology, but right now on the practical side, I'm brokenhearted because my brother died and can I be so brave as to say this? And I don't want to be critical of Martha. Jesus, you let me down. 
while, you, while he was alive, there was hope. But hope has died. And one of the things that's so important for us to understand is that we can find that reflection in our own lives, that we need to understand that there are situations and issues in our life where even though they appear to be hopeless and even dead, we need to learn to bring them to the cross. Is there a situation in your life that seems to be a burden of hopelessness? Have you given up on your marriage? Have you given up on your family? Have you given up on your godly dreams? Now, uh, for, let's be honest. Sometimes we have dreams that aren't godly, and we probably sometimes need to give those dreams up. But do you feel like God has called you, and you haven't seen it happen? Have you given up and felt it was hopeless? Jesus came and and, and did this amazing miracle in front of Martha because he took away her burden of hopelessness. Martha, it doesn't matter whether he's dead or alive. Interesting. Same thing happened in Jairus' story. It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter to God. I don't know what's going on in your life. I suspect that many of you carry a burden of hopelessness. Sometimes we almost make it spiritual. Oh, this is my cross to bear. No, 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 no. Jesus bore the cross for your hopelessness. He didn't give you a cross of hopelessness to bear. You say, Pastor Dave, you don't understand. I've, I've wanted this. I've prayed for this. I, I, it just, just can't work anymore. Really? What is more amazing than bringing a man who's been dead so long back to life? Jesus picks up the burden of hopelessness. This is one of my favorite stories. If you've been in IES very long, you've heard me talk about this story a lot. It's John chapter 8. It's an amazing story, and it's so badly misunderstood by so much of the world today. And Jesus has gone into Jerusalem, and he's gone into Jerusalem at a very significant time. He's gone into the Feast of Tabernacles where they rejoice in the giving of the law. It's like the biggest party that Jerusalem has. I mean, it's an amazing event. Thousands of people come from everywhere. They bring their sacrifices with them, and they give a part of their sacrifice in the temple to worship God, and a part of their sacrifice in the temple goes to feed all the priests. But the rest of it is used to feed everybody else. It's like the biggest potluck in the world. You think the buffet at some of the hotels in Jakarta is impressive. You should have been in Jerusalem. And right in the middle of it, right in the middle of all these things where Jesus is going to say these amazing things, I am the light of the world, he's going to say. And I am the water of life, he's going to say. They bring this woman to him. She's been caught in the act of adultery. Not thinking about adultery, not something she did in the past. And they brought her to Jesus and they're going to kill her right there, right there, right there. It's her. She's the one. It's also a trap. What happens? You know how this goes. Jesus talks to them for a little while. They're full of anger and everything else. But what's going on here in my mind has to do with the humiliation of this woman. I mean, really, talk about an unfair deal. You all understand this, right? The very act of adultery takes at least two people. She's the only one who's been caught. There's no question who's the target here. She's been thrown on the ground. The rocks are prepared. She's going to die in a very cruel way. And it's a way of complete humiliation. She carries an enormous burden of shame. How will her life ever be the same even if she survives somehow? So we all know, we all know who Jesus is, right? He can say, yeah, go ahead, kill her. She deserves it. And he's right. Nobody can complain. He can also say, no, it's okay. I forgive her and she can be set free. And think about that if she's set free. Everybody looks at her every time she walks by and says, hold on to your husbands. That's the one. This enormous burden of shame. So what does Jesus do? You know the story, I think. If you don't, like I said, go to your phone. Not now, later. Look up John chapter 8 and read it. 
Jesus says to them, okay, okay. And then he kind of squats down and he starts doodling with some things on the ground. And, and this is one of the great questions of, of Bible study. What was he doing writing on the ground? Now, I have my own firm opinion. Other people have different opinions and they're wrong and I'm right, let me just tell you. All right. I didn't believe it all my life. I heard it until I heard Rick Watts. Rick Watts' rule of thumb is what? Where have we seen this before? And when he talked about this passage, Rick said, where have we seen before when God writes in clay with his finger? The Feast of Tabernacles was celebrating the giving of the law, which God himself wrote with his very finger. So I'm convinced. Jesus scribbles. And then he says, whoever here has never sinned, you can throw the first stone. This is a dilemma because there's a whole crowd there. And if you've sinned and you throw the first stone, there are people going to say, eh, wait a minute. There, there have been people who have suggested, I don't know if it's true, that maybe even some of them there had sinned with her. And if one of them would have picked up that rock, she would have said, hey, Billy Bob, wait a minute, what about last summer? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But they were beginning to feel a little bit of the shame because they couldn't pretend they were innocent and they couldn't admit they were guilty. Jesus just goes back, draws a few more things. Maybe thou shalt not commit adultery would be one of them. And one by one, they all leave. Then he says to the woman, woman, there's nobody here, nobody to condemn you. And she says, no, they all left. And he says this, I'm not gonna condemn you either, Go and sin no more. Now, the modern translation of that, as it's, as it's quoted in the internet all the time, is that somehow Jesus said, it's okay, be yourself, live free. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, woman, you're guilty, but I forgive you. Stop. Shameful behavior. The burden of shame that she had. The life of shame that she had. She didn't, she didn't start off by saying, I, I want to be, be an embarrassment to my family. Uh, I want people to look down on me. I want to sleek around and sneak around in the middle of the night. But now she had this enormous burden of shame, and it was brought into the open. In our world today, we carry a burden of shame. The things that you've done that other people know you've done and you're hoping that it's never told. The things that you've done that nobody knows. And you think, you pray that somehow God missed it too. Jesus takes her shame. He says, lady, go. It's okay. I forgive you, but don't do it again. It's not just, it's not just forgiveness, it's, it's restoration. It's your shame is gone. When nobody else would stand up for you, I stand up for you. I give you value. I stand in front of a crowd and I stare them down. I cover your shame. Don't behave shamefully anymore. He takes your shame. And ultimately he takes your shame to the cross. This is the burden of uncertainty. This is a different kind of burden, and, and it's, it comes from one of the most unusual stories in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 23, it's already the, the, the really serious time in the Gospel where Jesus is already being crucified. And in, in the book of Luke, we get some details in there that nobody else has for us because Luke is... A little bit later, and he's been able to do the research, and the Holy Spirit has helped him bring the story together. And the person that bears the burden of uncertainty is one of the thieves on the cross. See, there's two of them. The Romans, they, they, they mostly crucify slaves, political prisoners, or thieves, if they're slaves, or bandits. It's a terrible way to die. 
And the soldiers who are all there, they're mocking him. And even one of the other thieves that's there is mocking him. Because let me tell you, if the soldiers are making fun of the man who's being tortured with you, the one thing you want to do is be on the side of the soldiers, right? Because you're thinking, the only way I can get out of here is if they let me down, and I better do whatever I can. So if you don't like him, I don't like him either. The enemy of my, the person who has authority over me will become my enemy. And then there's this guy there that's on the other cross. We don't know anything about him. We don't know his name. We don't know his significance. We just know it's a true story. He scolds the other guy, and then he says to Jesus, please remember me. What, a, what, a, what did he know? He doesn't know theology. He, he doesn't know doctrine. He doesn't know about the resurrection. He doesn't really know anything about anything except he has heard perhaps of the triumphal entry that Jesus had. And he wondered if this might be something special that God is doing. But believe me, any thought he had of that was quickly wiped away because they were going to die together. The only thing he had, the only certainty he had was nothing. And just said to Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. They weren't on a kingdom path. They were on crosses, and they were going to die an ugly death. Jesus said these amazing words to him. Later today, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, we're, we're, we're so world-focused here. We're so this life-focused. This, this passage of Scripture is placed in the Word of God to assure us that when we are not here, we are there with Him. And no matter how long we live this life on this earth, it doesn't end for us. You and I know that. We, we, we will hear sermons about it tomorrow and the next day. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. I would suggest to you that there are some of you out there today that you carry a burden of uncertainty. You say, Pastor Dave, if I only knew what God wanted, I would follow him. Pastor Dave, if only I knew for sure what it would happen. Pastor Dave, I don't understand if I follow Jesus, what's it going to mean in my relationship with? Well, I, Pastor Dave, will I have to give up things? I'd like to follow Jesus, but man, it seems really, really a high cost. It's that uncertainty. What, what will my life be like? What will my life be like if I surrender my life to one who, died, who loved me so much he died for me? Come on, a lot of times in life we're willing to surrender our lives for people who just look good. Jesus took away the man's uncertainty. When the man was on the cross, he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know how Jesus was going to respond. He didn't know anything. All he knew was it was the only hope he had. And Jesus took away his uncertainty and offered him everything. I've, I've just talked about five things today. I'm getting old, so I have to write these things down. Past mistakes. You may be here today and you've made mistakes in your past. I want you to know and understand that when Jesus died on the cross, he ended those mistakes. He forgave those mistakes. He paid for those mistakes. We've done past mistakes. Some of you perhaps feel insignificant. Maybe you haven't been as successful. Maybe you haven't been as attractive. Maybe you haven't been as desirable. Maybe you haven't been as worthwhile. The Lord takes away insignificance because insignificance means nothing to him. Everyone on this earth was worth him dying for. 
The next thing we see is hopelessness. Are there things in your life that you think are hopeless? Are there, are there things in your life that you think are even dead? Your, your possibilities, your, your career, your, your family, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your parents, your ability to influence others, all the dreams that you had. We need to remember that in that time of hopelessness, that God can take things that are hopeless and even dead, that Jesus took those things on the cross, and he can make your life to not only be significant, but he can renew your hope. Shame. If I was to say, in the 10 minutes, we're going to show the videos of the most shameful part of your lives, that I've had camera crews, you know what happened to Jeff Bezos. I've had camera crews following 10 of you for the last five years, and I'm going to show those sayings. Nobody here would, leave, would stay because you'd be afraid that you'd be one of the five. Out of 1,000 people here, it wouldn't be worth taking the chance of being that 0.5%. We need to surrender our shame to Jesus and to ask him forgiveness and then to be set free by his forgiveness to live the kind of life that he wants us to live. Uncertainty. You may be here and say, Pastor Dave, this really sounds good, but I'm just not really sure if I understand enough yet. That's okay. See, you don't need to understand everything about following Jesus before you follow Jesus. In fact, let me say to you, I, as long as I have studied, and I'm not a great scholar, I just do my best. As long as I have studied and tried to understand the truth of Scripture about the nature of God and the incarnation and all those other things like that, what I understand and what you don't understand is the same thing. It means nothing. Because God is the God who receives those who struggle with the burden of uncertainty. I would just follow him if I knew, if I understood, if I could get it. No. The first step is faith. 